All morning long, I've been wanting to sing the song about love is a flag flown high in the castle. We're singing that tonight. Singing that tonight. VBS, 6.30. Adult class, 6.45. Over in the, this area. Tomorrow night. Thursday, uh, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, class, hope you'll be here. There is absolutely no excuse for what Paula Dean said. I have no idea what it was. They haven't told us. But it's bad. There's no room in our world for racial slurs or racial idioms. There just isn't. The Bible says there's neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, male nor female. For we are all one. We ought to be one. But... Paula Dean's credit, that woman has gotten on national television, bared her soul, confessed her sin, apologized profusely, now what's the response? You know what irritates me about this? What irritates me about this is I am just almost willing to guess, and I don't think I'd be very far wrong, that a good portion of the people who have shaken their finger at Paula Dean and saying, shame, 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 are guilty themselves. You reckon? You ever said anything which was derogatory towards someone? Don't raise your hands, but I will because I have. And when it was brought to my attention, I repented just like Paula Dean has repented. I remember a story in Gospel of John chapter 8 about a woman who was caught in the bed with another man, adultery, brought to Jesus. Oh, those self-righteous guys brought her, and when they got her there, they said, Lord, we caught this woman in bed with another man in adultery in the very act thereof. What are you going to do about it? The Bible says, stone her. What does Jesus say? Tell you what, those of you who are standing here who have no sin, you can be the first ones to throw the stones. I've always admired that text for what it taught me about mercy, because from the sinfulest, the eldest, they had accumulated more, they began to depart. Jesus had taken the, the sails out of their wind, the wind out of their sails. It works both ways. <laughs> Jesus looks at the woman and he says, where are your accusers? She says, they're gone. And he says, I'm not going to condemn you either. What I'm going to tell you to do is go and do not sin anymore. So what I think ought to happen, it's not going to probably, but I think that everybody ought to just forgive Paula. She's learned a very valuable lesson. She's humiliated herself, and I seriously doubt that she will ever consciously do it again, whatever it was.
That gets us to our text. Romans chapter 14. This, I think, is what Jesus is talking about here through the Apostle Paul, the Spirit giving Paul these insights. He says, those of you who are stronger ought to give a little help to those who are weaker. One person has faith that he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats vegetables only. The one who eats is not to regard with contempt the one who does not eat, and the one who does not eat is not to judge the one who eats, for God has accepted him. You see, he's talking about the problem of opinions. He's talking about the problems of, well, we don't have absolute specific scripture here. We have principle involved. We know what's the higher course, the better road, the, the way in which we ought to do it. But sometimes we don't practice it. We don't look at one another and say, you know, I can't agree with you on this, but... I can't find any rational reason in Scripture to condemn you. Therefore, I'm going to just go ahead and accept you because I'm not going to condemn you. I can't. Now, we have a thus saith the Lord. That changes things. I believe that far too many of us in this world have what I will call the Jonah complex. You know what the Jonah complex is? Well, let me tell you the story of Jonah in case you've forgotten some of it. Jonah was told by God to go to Nineveh. <clears throat> Nineveh was not a Jewish city. In fact, Assyria had been a real problem. God had used Assyria mightily. There was a lot of prejudice built up. God says to Jonah, Jonah, they've become so wicked, I'm going to destroy them. I want you to go preach to them. I want you to go preach, they'll repent. And Jonah said, man, I'm not going to do that. There's no way that a God-fearing Jew is going to go to those sinful, evil, ugly, mean people and try to tell them that they need to repent. So I tell you what I'm going to do, I'm going to run away. And he gets on the ship, and the ship gets in the storm that God sends, and then after God has sent the storm... They say someone on here is creating a problem. They figure out it's Jonah. They throw him overboard. He's swallowed by the big fish. Do I believe that literally happened? Absolutely. Yes, I do. God could have taken a minnow and swelled him up to take care of Jonah if that was what was necessary. We call it Jonah and the whale, and I don't have any problem with that. I don't know why people make such a big issue. But what I do know is there in the belly of the fish, Jonah had a come to Jesus meeting. You ever heard those? He, he, he had a come to, I'm going to have to look at myself more seriously here. This situation is pretty critical. I'm going to be digested by this fish if I don't pray to the Lord. And he is then regurgitated. God gets him out of there. And he's learned his lesson. He's learned his lesson. He's going to go to Nineveh. And so he goes to Nineveh and he begins to preach and he doesn't get very far because Nineveh is a three-day journey across there. He doesn't get very far and the people begin to repent. In fact, even the leaders of the city, the king, they put on the sackcloth and the ashes. They repent. Now I'll tell you what, Jonah wasn't much of a preacher according to preachers like me, because if I were to preach a sermon to a group of people and all the people repented, I would be saying, whoa, wow. My frustration is we don't repent. You can preach from now till the Lord comes, and some of us are just going to sit there with stone hearts. You would have thought Jonah would have just jumped for joy. <clears throat> No, no, that wasn't Jonah's egg goes out and sulks. Begins to sulk, he sits under the vine that God gives him, and then when God takes it away, he gets angry. Jonah's just mad. 
You know what Jonah's problem was? Jonah was just arrogant. That's exactly the problem that Jonah had. Jonah was just plain arrogant. He thought, I am a part of God's chosen people. God's going to take care of God's chosen people. And we don't want any <laughs> repentance from any of those other folks, those Gentiles, those evil Assyrians, those Ninevites. We just are going to be God's people and no one else. <sighs> Chapter 4, verse 1, it greatly displeased Jonah. He became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, Please, Lord, was not this what I said while I was still in my own country? Therefore, in order to forestall this, I fled to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abundant in loving kindness, and one who relents concerning calamity. Now for, O Lord, please take my life from me, for death is better to me than life. That is the strangest statement in Scripture to me. Because what Jonah says is the very reason that Israel had a covenant relationship, the very reason that, that Jonah had a covenant relationship with God was because of God's very nature. God is full of compassion and graciousness. And God is slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness. Jonah should have been rejoicing. Here are all these people who have repented here are all these people who have been changed. He should have been saying, good, wonderful. Now before you get too harsh on Jonah, stop and ask yourself. Have you been condemning Paula Dean? <clears throat> when if you look into your hearts of hearts and your vocabulary, maybe you said something you shouldn't have said. I taught at Southwestern Christian College for a year. All of my students were black. I was white. One day we were sitting in class. One of my best students, James Bess, raised his hand. He says, Brother Waller, he says, it's kind of tough on you, isn't it? I said, what do you mean, James? He said, because we can say things about one another and get away with it, and you'd get fired if you did. And I said, James, we're all missing the boat if that's the way it is. We're all missing the boat because the boat is those who are stronger ought to bear the infirmities of those who are weak. We ought to be leading people upward. You see, one of the things that I encourage us to be is a salvation company. We're interested in the redemption of people, not the condemnation of people. God can take care of the judging. We need to take care of spreading His message and doing the saving. That's why Romans 14 is here. That's why Romans 15 is here. He, he, he's going to tell us that we have a role and a responsibility. This is what the church is to be about. We have Vacation Bible School because we want to bring people in so that we can teach children the gospel, so that maybe we can encourage parents to come, so that maybe we can redeem some people with the blood of Jesus. We preach the Word. God gives the increase. So we preach salvation, we preach the gospel. And then we work at keeping the saved saved, and that's kind of a problem sometimes because some of us are a little bit harder than others of us to walk in the light. Some of us have bigger problems than some of us who don't have so big a problems, and we need someone who is a little bit stronger to help us. Because we're in the salvation business. So how do we do that? After one becomes a Christian, how do we do that? Paul's going to say five things in this text, down through verse 12, that we need to listen to. Number one, he says that if we are the stronger, we accept the one who is weak in faith, not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinions. We got to be careful, folks, how we treat one another. 
I had a woman tell me one time when I said something that I shouldn't have said, which I say things I shouldn't say pretty frequently, you ought to know better than that. And I said, yes, ma'am, I should. But I was just acting like you've taught me. Boy, she didn't like that. But she had said a lot of things too. Preaching in Gustine, and I got tired of all the gossip, man. It was just all the time. <clears throat> so I taught a sermon on it. I preached a Bible class on it. Worst offender came up to me and she says, I don't know who in the world's doing all this talking. <laughs> I said, well, sister, I think you need to spend a little time looking at your own heart and looking at your own tongue. Except the one who is weak in faith. The Hebrew writer gives a specific instruction, chapter 12, beginning in verse 12. Therefore strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble. Make straight paths for your feet so that the limb which is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. Pursue peace with all men and the sanctification, listen to this last statement, and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. If we don't learn to bear one another's infirmities and to treat one another with love and respect, even when we are wrong and out of line, we're going to have a problem. Number two, Paul asks a question that you and I need to ask ourselves. Are we judges? Or are we encouragers? And then he says, who are you, verse 4, to judge the servant of someone else? I'm a servant of the Lord. I'm not your slave. You're a servant of the, Lord, servant of the Lord. You're not my slave. We belong to the Lord. The Lord is the one who's going to judge. So we need to be careful. What does Jesus say in Matthew chapter 7? Judge not that you be not judged, for with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. Oh, judgmental business, we need to be careful. Who are you to judge the servant of another? <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul says, Therefore do not go on passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the things hidden in the darkness and disclose the motives of men's hearts, and then each man's praise will come to him from God. God says, I'm going to open up the windows and let you see into the heart like I see into the heart. <clears throat> Some of you are going to be fooled. I had a young associate when I was in Claremore, Oklahoma that came in. He walked into my office one day and he says, I think we ought to clear all the dead wood out of the church. He says, we got a lot of dead wood sitting on the pew and they're not doing anything and, and we need to clear them out so we can make room for people to really do something. And I said, well, give me an illustration. What dead wood are you talking about? And he called a person's name. I actually called a couple's name. <clears throat> I said, oh, they're dead wood says, don't see them doing a thing. I said, do you know what they're doing in their life? I said, do you know that they're taking care of his parents? But not only that, that that brother that you're calling Deadwood mows at least three more widows' yards, two of his neighbors who aren't Christians, and one lady who's not too far around the corner who is a Christian. <clears throat> He's not doing anything for Jesus. Son, the only dead wood I see is you. I didn't say that to him, but that's what I was thinking. We've got to be careful to judge the servant of another. Third thing he says, verse 7. Not one of us lives for himself. Not one of us dies for himself. If we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. We've got the wrong perspective sometimes because we don't realize we're in the salvation business. We think we're in the keep everything orthodox business. Well, I believe we ought to practice sound doctrine. If you quote me otherwise, I'll call you a fibber. Only I'll start it with the word, with the letter L. 
I believe we practice sound doctrine, but I think we've also got to be involved in redeeming people. Our God and our concept of forgiveness far too often has been way too small. We need to be more generous toward folks. Bear the weaknesses of the weak so that we can raise them up to be strong. Instead of sitting there and picking them apart. The Apostle Paul understood this principle for us. We don't live for ourselves. We live for the Lord. You remember when he talked about his great change in his life, Galatians chapter 2? What does he say? I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I that live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. What? I've been crucified with Christ? I don't live for myself. I live for Christ? Paul, Paul, wait a second, wait a second. What are you talking about? I live by faith in the Son of God. I trust God to be the judge and me to just be the one who carries out His Word and does His will. Yeah, that's what Paul says. <clears throat> because this Son of God loved me and gave Himself for me. How did Paul describe himself to Timothy? He says, Timothy, I am the chief of sinners. First book, chapter 1, verse 15. I'm the chief of sinners. I am the worst sinner in the world. We ought to live like a forgiven people, but I do believe, brethren, that we need to never forget the fact that we once were lost in sin and we have been forgiven. Don't forget where you've come from. That you were lost, but now you have a right relationship with Christ Jesus. So here's this brother struggling with something. He was lost. Maybe he's struggling with his relationship with Jesus. Encourage him. Build him up. Forgive him. Number four, Paul says, verse 10, why do you judge your brother? Why do you judge your brother? Man, I'm preaching to Robert this morning because I know good and well most of my life I have been a very, 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 very judgmental person. And I was wrong. <laughs> Show me in the scriptures where it tells us to judge our brother. I can't find that passage. Occasionally we judge with righteous judgment, but it's not our judgment. When it's righteous judgment, it's God's judgment. But let me show you what else is said in the Scripture. Love your brothers. Be kind to one another. Forgive one another, just as God in Christ has forgiven you. This is the way people are going to know that you are my people, because you love one another. <clears throat> There's power in those words. It makes a difference to us when we apply those words. So don't judge because you're going to be judged by the standard by which you judge others. I'd rather have mercy, wouldn't you? And I get mercy by being merciful. That's what James tells us. I get mercy by being merciful. But then the last thing that he says to us about keeping us in the salvation business, the helping one another business, so then each of us will give an account of himself to God. Each of us will give an account of himself to to God. Paul writes to the church at Corinth, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. We're all going to stand before the judgment seat, 
And we're going to have to answer in the body what we have done, whether it be good or whether it be evil. We're going to have to answer, you will, I will, for me, you for you, me not for you, you not for me. Hope I got that right. Get the point. Get the point. We need to learn to be merciful to one another. Except the one who is weak in faith. <coughs> I have no part in a lot with Paula Dean. I've never seen her cooking show. <coughs> I don't know what kind of language she used. But I tell you what I'm going to do, and she's, I, as far as I know, she's not my sister in Christ. I'm, not, I'm just using that as an illustration. You understand that, I hope. I'm going to forgive her. I'm, I'm going to forgive her. I'm going to encourage her to be a better person. I wouldn't cancel her contract with the cooking thing. That's what's wrong with this world, all this political correctness and everything. When people repent, we ought to give them a chance. People want to do better, they want to do right. We ought to give them a chance. I'm going to forgive her. And hopefully, if I ever offend Paula Dean, she'll forgive me. Do you see the point I'm trying to make? Bear one another's burdens. Fulfill the law of Christ. Lift one another up. Make a difference in each one, one's life because we bear with these weaknesses and we try to strengthen one another to become more and more and more what Jesus wants us to be. That's the lesson. There may be someone here this morning who needs to, to make a change in their life. You know, I can tell you nothing more glorious can happen to you than for you to become a disciple of Jesus. And if you've not been immersed into Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, this morning would be a good day and a good time. If you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and you're willing to confess that belief to the whole world and confess it throughout your life, and you'll turn from sin and turn toward God in repentance, He can wash you and make you new. He can baptize, we can baptize you into Christ and you can be raised with, with the full assurance that your sins are washed away, Acts 2.38, and that you're raised to walk in newness of life, Romans chapter 6, verse 4. We give you that opportunity this morning. Maybe as a Christian you haven't been living as you ought to live, haven't been responding to the teachings of Christ as you ought to. People, we need to bear with those who have difficulties and problems. You never know when you're going to find yourself offending and needing some mercy. This morning, if you need to ask for the prayers of your brothers and sisters, you have struggles in your life, whatever it might be, we extend the invitation of Jesus. If we can help you today, we want to. If you need to come, would you come? While together we stand and sing a song to encourage.